Mille grazie professor Antonelli per, per vostra, vostra presentazione. Uh, uh, I thought I could uh, do it in Italian or even in Portuguese, but uh, uh, I'm sure that for the sake of your uh, understanding uh, of what I would like to present to you, it's maybe better to speak uh, this uh, universal language that uh, anyone can understand. So my excuses for not speaking in Italian. Uh, it is indeed a great uh, honor and a privilege to be here and to be invited by the Accademia Nazionale dei Lincei uh, to give this talk. Professor Antonelli uh, told me about this series of conferences on the future of academies, and so I will speak uh, a bit about this, uh, 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 what are the challenges that academies of sciences and humanities are facing today when you think about the future uh, in Europe. But uh, uh, I will talk also, and especially in the second part of my presentation, on topics to which uh, that are more familiar to my own research agenda, which is the history of economic ideas and economic and political ideas, and I will try to give you some uh, uh, perspective of what were the relations between Portuguese and Italian scholars uh, in late 18th century, which were at the basis of the foundation of the uh, uh, Academia das Ciências de Lisboa. So Europe faces major challenges at the present time uh, with unpredictable consequences for what the future may bring. We all know that both the nature and the relevance of the problems does not admit easy, easy solutions, whether when it comes to matters referring to the relationships of human beings with the surrounding natural world, uh, climate change, uh, pandemics, energy transition, natural catast catastrophes, or when social and political imbalances on a national and global scale are at stake, migrations refugee flows, extreme inequalities, wars, threats to democracy, uh, uprising of populism. What is the role of the academies of sciences and humanities in this unstable and uh, restless world? Our academies are institutions with a notable historical record of creation, dissemination and promotion of science, culture, arts and humanities. Yet they have an irreplaceable role in establishing bridges and uh, networks between global agents of knowledge and wisdom. Academies are active institutions in the field of science diplomacy and scientific cooperation and they contribute to the design of science-driven uh, public policies based on evidence guided by principles of public purpose and common good. Therefore, they can definitely contribute to the shaping of a better future, namely as regards the construction of relationships of human understanding. Their contribution to shape our common future is closely related to their historical legacies, as the connections between Portuguese and Italian scholars in late 18th century clear illustrates. So these times we are living, uh, in, in, and this will be uh, the, top, the two topics that I will address in this presentation. So first, uh, general considerations on science diplomacy and what are the challenges there that we are facing, and then the science diplomacy uh, case study of Portuguese and Italian relationships in late 18th century. These times we are living uh, uh, in show that the role of academies and learned societies delivering science and knowledge services to supporting and monitoring the implementation of public policies is undisputable. Being institutions that are independent from universities, uh, uh, from national research units or corporate interests, and I would like to stress this role of academies as independent institutions, the science academies and learned societies bring together different partners and stakeholders. The uh, scientific expertise and science advice are crucial to promote evidence-informed policy making, lowering the risk associated to the setting up uh, of uh, uh, the agenda, setting up the agenda, and to decision processes that require sound and strong scientific grounds. The academies reinforce the role of institutional diversity to promote scientific development and to address high priority issues relevant for national and European policies. 
by making bridges between different uh, research and development and science and technology institutions, by enhance, enhancing the capacities of individual partners and institutions to join efforts to serve the common good, academies stand up as major players contributing to the achievement of societal goals. Uh, European Union and United Nations targets for two, two, uh, uh, 2030 and 2050 in terms of social and economic sustainable development goals make us believe that science is indeed a central player to bring us into a better future. So we are living a, a special moment and a special opportunity to show the relevance of science and relevance of the cooperation between science academies. The control of the pandemic seems to be over, although the recovery and the resilience plans are still taking shape and uh, waiting for their implementation. Extreme weather events constantly prove that climate change is not fake news. Uh, the digital and the energetic transition, uh, the, review, uh, the, the discussion on renewable and clean energies impose considerable changes in our way of facing the future. And the social, economic and political consequences of the persistent war situation in Ukraine affecting international relations at both the national and international levels clearly demonstrate that the global world is no longer what it used to be. What is new about these uh, uh, events is their cumulative effects of the problems that need urgent solutions. We are not talking about problems that uh, uh, occur one upon it another, but we are talking about problems that occur simultaneously. And so the, uh, these problems that need urgent solutions are at the same time uh, the aftermath of uh, pandemic COVID-19, the war in Ukraine, natural catastrophes, economic crisis stag with stagnation, inflation and employment. And at the present moment, it is particularly relevant the situation in Ukraine and the claim for peace and security at the international level, a new topic of international politics originated by the situation of war. So in this situation, the relevance and the opportunity of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the mission-oriented approaches to solve grand societal challenges are even greater. Uh, one relevant example, which I will not develop here, but that you are certainly quite aware of, is the, the drama of uh, migrant flows. The risk of new waves of anti-migrant sentiments. The need to include migrants on social and economic recovery plans. The need to put forward legal channels that give the migrants the possibility of benefiting from inclusive public policies. The urgency of achieving rapid responses as regards the efforts to foster transnational cooperation, enabling different countries to receive immigrants in their territories, etc., etc. So there are plenty of opportunities, not only to discuss these issues, but also to bring scientists together, especially in the field of human sciences, of humanities and social sciences, uh, to discuss all these issue, the, the issues that are uh, uh, challenging Europe in a certain sense. When addressing some of the above mentioned issues, scientists know that society demands uh, better responses for the questions raised. Uh, and these are some of the problems that need careful attention. The gap between uh, fundamental research, excellent science, and applied research, uh, and, uh, sorry, b the gap between fundamental research and applied research has not always been solved in a satisfactory way. The connections between groundbreaking, curiosity-driven research and innovative technological solutions brought to the market should be better articulated. And I would like here to stress the relevance of uh, social sciences and humanities in, as uh, a missing element of the knowledge chain which is particularly relevant today. Although there is no dispute today about the need to include and integrate social sciences and humanities, uh, the contributions from social sciences and, 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 and humanities, the place that, uh, in the overall structure uh, of the European research agenda and priorities is still very weak. The challenges faced by Europe requiring research attention by social sciences and humanities scholars are immense. Therefore, 
it should not be difficult to establish some research priorities on topics such as migrations, uh, aging, new family structures, food consumption and sustainable food systems, religious tolerance, social exclusion, poverty and inequalities, unemployment and labor market changes, quali the quality of democracy, corruption, active citizenship, <coughs> trust, populist uprising, sustainability, social, economic, environmental, cultural, uh, the discussion about the future of green city, cities, urban mobility, etc., etc. So there are plenty of motives and of reasons that uh, uh, should uh, uh, impose more attention to uh, the, the social sciences and humanities agenda in science discussion about the ch the, the, these issues that are challenging Europe. Therefore, Scientific academies and learned societies should be asked to play a major role within the wider engagement with uh, and uh, reflection on the public understanding of science, the science diffusion in the public sphere, the communication in dissemination of science achievements, the building up of an intellectual and political commitment fostering the development of open science. Science has gained great attraction in the public sphere, especially as a consequence of, of the scientific responses to COVID-19. And so there is no, no doubt about the purpose uh, of science and relevance in science for building better societies. The academies of sciences and humanities are players, and I'm just summarizing here some points that, uh, that uh, uh, correspond to this first part of my presentation. The academies of sciences and humanities are players and active agents of scientific, economic, and political diplomacy, promoting international cooperation, exchange and dissemination of knowledge and expertise between countries, as well as individual agents and sharing the outcomes of the process of science uh, creation. Uh, the academies can play an important, unique role in building bridges between nations and in uh, fostering uh, uh, international cooperation, especially during times of political tensions and economic and social turmoil. The success of scientific academies as diplomatic agents highly depends on the level of institutional support that is provided to scientists engaged in collaborative activities. Academies offer the ground for successful individual action and cooperation at the scientific level. Although not being directly engaged in the original production of scientific knowledge, because most of the members of the academies do their, 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 their work, their research work in their universities, in their institutes, and not in the academies, although not being directly engaged in the original production of scientific knowledge, the academies play an essential role in promoting science and scientific evidence as the basis for scientific innovation and technological progress a role that should also be extended to the design and the monitoring of public policies based on scientific independent, independent advice. And this is basically the point that I would like to stress here and to present here to you. And, and I will not bother you with further considerations which you can see in the written text provided that will be uh, uh, published uh, by, uh, uh, as Professor Antonelli uh, said, in which I try uh, and this is the third point which I will pass over now, it's the role of academies of sciences and humanities as promoters of qualified public policies and as builders of a better world. And I think that uh, at least the experience that we are now having in Lisbon with the Academy of Sciences in Lisbon is just to show to the government, to the parliament, to also the, the advice services of the President of the Republic that the Academia de Ciências de Lisboa can play a role by uh, 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 providing independent advice on policy uh, on, on public policy issues, uh, especially not only because we have specialists in our academy that can give this advice, but especially because we can establish bridges and invite members of different universities, not in Portugal and uh, in other countries, in order to, uh, to join the best advice for issues that uh, need science, uh, both the art sciences but also the social sciences as the evidence based for uh, 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 public policies, provided that these public policies uh, are the instrument for us to reach a better world. And now I move to the second part of my presentation.
question, which is to try to uh, illustrate how these issues of science diplomacy and the articulation between academies uh, took place between Portugal in, and Italy in late 18th century. So let us now look at the problems of science diplomacy from a different angle, from a historical perspective, with which corresponds to some of the main topics of my own research agenda on the history of economic and political ideas in late 18th century and early 19th century. The legacy of the Academia das Ciências de Lisboa, which was created in 1779, offers rich testimonies of public purpose. Its founders and first members reached levels of scientific quality that resulted, to a large extent, from their favorable attitude towards international exchange, from their cosmopolitan positioning, from their desire to emulate the results obtained by similar institutions. The founding fathers of the Academy of Lisbon carried out scientific discoveries and contributed to the progress and dissemination of scientific outcomes. Among them, we find different practitioners of letters, arts and sciences, natural scientists, as well as philosophical travelers, collectors of objects and samples of the natural world, all of them interested in promoting the development of their country, without forgetting that no country is an island. They made the Academy of Sciences of Lisbon a place of open science as well as a place of shared knowledge. And I believe that is precisely these principles of open science and shared knowledge that still make the, our academies important forum for the discussion of issues related with public policies. The creation of the Lisbon Academy in 1779 was to some extent the outcome of a strong Italian uh, inspiration. So we have here science diplomacy at its best. One of the main mentors and first secretary of the Academy was José Correa da Serra, here in the painting. And Correa da Serra uh, was not only the mentor, but he was also the first secretary of the Academy between uh, uh, seven year, uh, 10 years, sorry. And uh, he lived 20 years of his life in Naples, of his youth in Naples, where he got his education and background formation as a scientist, keeping close contacts with major figures of Neapolitan enlightenment. Needless to say anything about the, the force and the relevance of Naples as a source of uh, the Illuminismo uh, 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 in Italy and in Europe in late 18th century. And these are the, the milestones of uh, Correa da Serra life. So he lived in Rome, uh, first in Rome and then in Naples most during uh, the 20 years. He moved to Lisbon. Uh, uh, in 1777, uh, and he created the Royal Academy of Sciences Lisbon in, in 1779. Then uh, he uh, was accused of having uh, relations with uh, the Jacobin uh, revolutionaries who came from France to Portugal after the French Revolution, and he had to move to London, where he met uh, Joseph Banks, where he was a member of the Royal Society, where he uh, uh, published his uh, uh, paper on botanics, especially on botanics and also on mineralogy in the transactions of the Royal Society, also a member of the Linnean Society. Then he lived in Paris for another couple, uh, another 10 years and with uh, strong uh, connections with Cuvier and Candolle and other naturalists uh, around the Museum of Natural History in Paris. Also, he lived in the uh, United States. He was the first Portuguese ambassador uh, in the United States, and uh, he was a close friend of Thomas Jefferson. Still today, in Monticello, there is a room, which is the room of the Abbé, Correa da Serra, uh, and uh, Correa da Serra was uh, uh, treated as a uh, uh, savant, uh, 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 and, and, and his uh, capacity of uh, uh, giving an opinion in different science uh, d domains was uh, acknowledged by Jefferson, as it was, has been acknowledged also by Benjamin Franklin. So, and, so, and then he came to Lisbon after the liberal revolution in 1820, and he died in Lisbon in, in, in 23. So these milestones uh, show what was a colorful life of a scientist was, above all, a citizen of the world, a practitioner of science diplomacy. 
a lively example of what uh, Franco Venturi uh, referred to uh, as the cosmopolitan element of uh, Illuminism. And he was really a cosmopolitan, a citizen of the world, and he learned a lot uh, during his stay in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Naples. The motto that the Lisbon Academy adopted uh, uh, conveys the enlightened principle of the useful of knowledge. And the motto of uh, the Academy is uh, Nisi utili, utile est quod facimus stulta est gloria. So, um, uh, enlightenment ideas strengthen the role of useful knowledge as applied to the, stu to the study of uh, social and economic problems. The acknowledgement of the scientific maturi maturity of the science of commerce as a field of intellectual inquiry and practical application to foster economic reforms was unconditionally welcomed. The political economists of the second half of the 18th century were looking after the physical and moral causes of economic backwardness and were naturally receptive to policy measures driven by the need to enhance the population skills leading to an increasing wealth and power of their nations. In some regards, there was an acceptance of an extended liberalization of economic mechanisms and institutions, especially as far as the defense of free competition in the internal market was concerned. But the typical enlightened disclaimers were also present. Uh, the submission of private property and individual economic agency to the rules of the common good and public purpose. The constraints to individual actions de de determined by the rationale of civil society and the trust on the role of the state as a factor of progress and development. This blueprint was essen essential to set the agenda of the Lisbon Academy of Sciences under the leadership of Correia da Serra. And all these ideas, these economic and social ideas, I believe that he learned this uh, especially in the context of the Neapolitan Enlightenment in special under the influence of uh, Antonio Genovesi. Commerce was a key element, but not the only way to catch up. It was also necessary to create industrial power and to reinforce the means to face economic competition at an international scale. Political economy was precisely the science that could help to understand how institutions could be for reformed to create the conditions for mutual benefits in exchange. Free trade could not be supported in abstract, but only provided that it would serve the purpose of increasing the wealth of the nation. So through the works of many uh, economists, political economists who wrote at the time, from Forbonnet, Ebert, the Gournay Group, Galliani, Genovese, Necker, the physiocrats, Turgot, Adam Smith, and so on and so forth, uh, enlightened political economy conveys a notion of the commercial society that challenges the conventional reconstructed vision about the role of market mechanisms and laissez-faire to foster economic development. In this context, the contribution given by Antonio Genovesi was particularly relevant. For Genovesi, uh, increased production, innovative entrepreneurship and techno technological change are key elements to understand the path to economic growth, but should by no means be solely considered as the outcome of individual agency uh, um, in competitive markets. His approach appeals to a way of dealing with the history of the emergence of political economy that challenges the reconstruction operated by historiographical traditions that do not always address properly the combination of individual action with the state responsibility and the ruling of the natural order of markets and society. And I develop here a bit more this idea, which, is, which conveys the idea in, in the case of Genovese, which is, is something that comes from Muratori's uh, notion of uh, uh, publica felicita, or felicita publica. And it is precisely this, this notion of publica felicita, the notion of economia civile in Genovese, that uh, brings us to, uh, to, to convey the idea that political economy is no longer a science of the, to explain the market, the function of the market, but is a science that tries to explain, explain how the market can bring 
the common good can realize a public purpose and how this notion of uh, uh, common good and publica felicita can uh, be reached. This is the message at, of uh, Lesione di Commercio or Sia di Economia Civile di Antonio Genovese, which has certainly influenced uh, José Correa da Serra when he was in Naples in the same years uh, that these courses by Genovese took place. And so this enlightenment uh, uh, influence in the study of political economy was uh, absolutely paramount for this agenda of the Academy of Sciences, which was to, to study the natural resources, to, to have uh, uh, the scientists co covering all the country and the colonies, especially in Brazil, trying to see how economic development and economic growth could take place in conditions that required not only the functioning of markets, but also this idea of a public purpose that should be granted by the state. The second example that I would like to give you is the, the, uh, of this interchange between Portugal and Italy in late 18th century is the work of uh, Domenico Vandelli. The institutionalization of the academy was also influenced by a group of Italian scientists who came to Portugal in the beginning of the of 1760s to lecture in scientific subjects at the Royal College of the Nobles of Lisbon. Uh, and later on to contribute to the reform in the development of the new syllabus of, at the University of Coimbra, reformed by the Marquise de Pombal uh, in 1772. Among them, a special reference is due to those who were nominated as founding members, members of the Lisbon Academy of Sciences, and who had a great experience of teaching scientific subjects in, in both the College of Nobles in Lisbon, and then at the University of Coimbra, and then at the Academy of Sciences. And they were uh, Michele Antonio Sierra in astronomy, Giovanni Angelo Brunelli in arithmetic and geometry, Michele Franzini in mathematics, Giovanni Antonio Dallabella on physics and chemistry, and the Above them all, Domenico Vandelli, who the, in Portuguese we call not Domenico Vandelli, but Domingos Vandelli, because he lived all his life in, Portu in Portugal, and so we took his name as being Portuguese with the name of Domingos and not Domenico. Vandelli writings, uh, and, and, and whose inspiration was uh, essential to establish the outstanding tradition of the Lisbon Academy uh, uh, of Sciences in economic studies. Vandelli's writings uh, stand out in the midst of the ab abundant literature produced on economic subjects under the auspices of the Academy. He was the author of texts that served as programs and guidelines in what was later to become one of the most important collections of documents for the study of political economy and Portuguese economic thought uh, at the end of the Ancien Regime. His basic concern was to encourage the preparation of a rigorous inventory a process in which he himself also participated of the existing natural resources that were potentially usable for productive and commercial purposes. Both in the metropolis and in the overseas territories, especially in Brazil, uh, so the proposals that he made for the undertaking of philosophical journeys uh, or the incentives that he sought to create uh, through the Academy of Sciences for the preparation of local and regional descriptive memoirs were instruments that were specifically designed for the purpose and had the aim of creating uh, diagno diagnostic elements that would make it possible to define a strategy for the optimal allocation of available resources. Sometimes he adopts a merely descriptive and naturalistic approach to the subject, limiting himself to making classifying annotations based on the system uh, designed by Linnaeus, with whom he corresponded uh, uh, during the early stages of his career in Padova. Vandelli was natural from, uh, came from Padova. On other occasions, however, Vandelli went beyond this simple naturalistic description and centered his analysis on the physical or moral, uh, I mean natural or social, obstacles uh, to the development of the agricultural sector or farther on the conditions that would permit an efficient use of natural, human and technical resources, both in terms of production and in the circulation of products and raw materials. 
So this diagnostic component of his work was coherently campaigned by proposals for reform and improvement that helped to put forward a strategic option for the economic development of the country based on agriculture. So although Vandelli came to Portugal to teach natural history and natural philosophy, he ended in, he ended in the Academy of Sciences by writing in numerous memoirs, uh, texts, uh, paper articles that were published in the collections of the Academy of Sciences on economic subjects. And these papers were not only natural descri descriptions of the natural world, but are descriptions of the natural world on topics uh, uh, of the different reigns of the natural world that could be uh, uh, subject to a better economic uh, uh, use. And so he became one of the leaders of this movement, of economic movement, of economic reformism in the Academy of Sciences in late 18th century, which was crucial for to put forward the reforms of the Ancien Regime and to the, for the modernization of Portuguese economy in late 18th century. So the Lisbon Academy was founded almost 250 years ago following with some delay the creation of similar institutions in Europe in the light of the spirit of the Enlightenment. Science was supposed to be useful. The scientists and the men of letters who founded this academy believed that they could contribute to the common good and public happiness. This motivation was partly due to the influence of enlightened ideas assimilated and adapted from Italian Neapolitan authors, as well as brought to Portugal by Italian scientists who actively participated in the reform of university studies and science institutions in Portugal during the last quarter of the 18th century. These intensive initiatives are the best historical justification to claim the embeddedness of science diplomacy concerns in the aims and scope of our institutions. Let us thus proceed with the same purpose that inspired uh, Correia da Serra and Domenico Vandelli, and uh, let's strengthen the collaboration between the Academia Nacional de Linche and the Academia das Ciências de Lisboa on issues and debates that uh, demand scientific commitment, independent advice, and the spirit of public purpose. Thank you very much.